Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're, we're going to get started in just, just a moment. People are filing in from the waiting room. Welcome to today's webinar on the California End of Life Option Act and how to access it. I'm Christina Goodwin, and I'm the California and Hawaii State Manager, and I will be your moderator. To ask a question at any time, type it into the Q&A box on your screen and click send. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Before we get started today, please note that today's webinar is being recorded. Also note that everyone is in view only mode. This means that both your audio and video functions are disabled and neither will appear in the recording. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Samantha Trad, the California and Hawaii State Director for Compassion and Choices and Tom Whaley, whose wife, Christine, took medical aid and dying medication in 2018. Compassion and Choices is the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit working to improve care, expand options, and empower everyone to chart their own end of life journey. We believe in patient-centered care where the person is in charge of making their own healthcare decisions. Also that people should be fully informed and supported by their doctors and medical team on the full range of end of life options. Before we get started, I wanna ask a polling question. How familiar are you with medical aid in dying? Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not at all familiar. All right, we're getting our responses in. Okay. All right, um, it looks like 66% are somewhat familiar and then 22% not at all familiar, followed by 12% very familiar. Well, we hope after today's pr presentation, you will become more familiar with the End of Life Option Act. Thank you. I'm now gonna turn it over to Samantha Trad. Thank you, Christina. Um, and thank you again, everybody for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our virtual webinar. Um, I know a lot of people are zoomed out, so I appreciate you making the time to make it today to talk about this important topic. So we wanted to ask another question. This time it's not a polling question. It's a little bit more personal. And um, normally when we do this in person, we ask people to raise their hand so you can just think for yourself if this is true for you or not. How many of you here today are going to die? Anybody? Uh, death can be a really hard thing to talk about, especially in our culture. But the good news is, is that talking about death won't hurt you. It'll actually help you to have a better end of life experience. And so that's why it's important to come to things like our webinar today. I have another question. How would you like to die? You know, take a couple minutes and just think in your head, what is your perfect death? Um, a lot of people, uh-oh. Sorry, I don't know if you guys see if the polling question came up, but um, a lot of people uh, compare death to birth. It's kind of a strange thing, but you know, the way you leave the world can be very similar with how you go into the world, right? Um, and people like to plan their birth as much as they can. I mean, the mother, not the person, obviously, but I have two kids and I remember putting together my birth plan, figuring out what I wanted. What do you want at the end of your life? How do you imagine it? So most people say that they would like to die at home, surrounded by family, with their pain managed. Most people don't wanna suffer. And very few people say that they would like to die in a hospital hooked up to machines. Um, but unfortunately, the truth is, is that most people tend to die in a hospital hooked up to machines in a way that they never wanted in the first place. Um, 
So that's why it's really important to know your end of life options. So we're going to talk now a little bit about the different end of life options that are available. There are many different end of life options, such as med all medical treatment interventions possible. And at Compassion and Choices, we fully support people's choice to receive every medical treatment possible and to die in an ICU if that is what they want. But if you don't want that, and I suspect many of us do not, Compassion and Choices is working hard to make sure you have options for the peaceful death of your choosing. There's refusing treatment or avoiding unwanted medical treatment. Every adult has the right to refuse unwanted medical treatment. This is part of every individual's right to choose what will be done to his or her own body, and it applies even when refusing medical treatment means that the person may die. There's hospice, which is an interdisciplinary team of caregivers providing comfort, support, and dignity to the terminally ill people when medical treatment is no longer expected to cure the disease or prolong life. And this service most often takes place in the home. And at the center of hospice and palliative care is the belief that each of us has the right to die pain-free and with dignity, and that our families will also receive the necessary support to allow us to do so. There's VSED, which is also known as voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And it's a legal right for any individual who wishes to shorten their dying process by refusing nourishment orally or through a feeding tube. It's a peaceful way to control the dying process if done under medical supervision with hospice and other palliative care. And it can be a really compassionate option for people with dementia and we do, our organization does offer presentations specifically about voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. There's palliative sedation or deep sedation, which is the continuous administration of medication to relieve severe intractable symptoms that cannot be controlled. And this unconscious or semi-conscious state is maintained until death occurs. And then there's medical aid in dying. And while hospice and palliative care can help most people most of the time, for some it's not enough. And for them, medical aid in dying should be an option. And I just wanna point out that all of these options, they're not mutually exclusive. Thanks, Christina. So here in California, the California End of Life Option Act was signed into law on October 5th, 2015, over five years ago. Governor Brown, when he signed the bill, made a really powerful statement. And he said, I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill. And I wouldn't deny that right to others. He signed the bill in 2015 and the law went into effect in June 2016. There has been ongoing support for the End of Life Option Act. There was a great study done last year by the California Healthcare Foundation that showed just like in 2014, 75% of Californians support the End of Life Option Act. In fact, they surveyed every single demographic and the majority of every demographic wanted the option of medical aid in dying. Asian Pacific Islanders um, polled at 76%, 70% of Black Californians, 68% of Latinos, and 82% of White Californians. California was the fifth state to authorize medical aid in dying. Today, there are nine states in Washington, D.C. that all have similar laws that are modeled after Oregon's. Oregon has had their law for over 20 years. Uh, on this map, you can see the dark blue states are states that have pending legislation. In fact, in Massachusetts, we're very close to passing a medical aid and dying law there. And we expect hopefully a few more states to come on board. So if you have friends or family in other states who are passionate about making sure everyone has the full range of end of life options available to them, uh, feel free to reach out to us because there's a good chance we have volunteers in their state. 
Um, speaking of volunteers, the yellow boxes show where we have active volunteers across the country. So what is medical aid in dying, Christina? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, medical aid in dying is one of many end of life options. It's a medical practice in which a terminally ill, mentally capable adult with a prognosis of six months or less to live may receive medication, which they can choose to self ingest to bring about a peaceful death. Medical aid in dying does not cause more people to die. It allows fewer people to suffer. Medical aid in dying is not considered suicide or assisted suicide. Now this is a really important point to, pe to, to make. People who want the option of medical aid in dying, uh, they don't want to die. Their terminal illness has robbed them of the option of life. And so they are taking medical aid and dying so that they don't have to suffer at the end of life. And it gives them a little bit of control over something they really don't have any control over. In fact, some people are offended by the term um, suicide or assisted suicide. It's also important to note that wills, contracts, insurance, and annuity policies are not affected. In fact, the death certificate lists the underlying terminal illness on the death certificate. It does not say medical aid and dying because that is what the person was suffering from their terminal illness. That is what robbed them of life. In fact, just having the pres prescri prescription, excuse me, gives patients a great sense of relief. Um, I met a man who told me he never met, felt more alive until, until the moment he got his medication in his hand. He said he hoped he never had to use his medication, but just having it gave him a new lease on life, which he said he knew sounded crazy, but he, he had been so worried about what his end of life would be, how much time he had left, if he would be suffering. And with that prescription, he knew that he could really enjoy his final weeks and days. And if his suffering became unbearable, he had an option to peacefully end it. Um, so even states that have authorized medical aid and dying polls have showed it just, it gives people a huge sense of relief to know that that option is there for them. So how do you, how are you, how is a person able to, to um, get a prescription for medical aid in dying? How do you qualify? The eligibility requirements are pretty simple. You need to be a California resident um, under the California End of Life Option Act. You need to be an adult, 18 years or older. You need to be terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live. You need to be capable of making medical decisions. This means this is not an option for someone who has advanced dementia. And you also need to be able to self-ingest the medication yourself. There's no assisting in this. The person takes the medication th themselves. Um, I do think it's important to say though that this can be an option for ALS patients. In fact, ALS is the second most common diagnosis of terminal illness of pa that a patient has who chooses the option of medical aid in dying with cancer being the first. So for example, if a, if a patient has a feeding tube as long as they're able to push the plunger themselves, they can take medical aid in dying if they meet the other eligibility requirements. So those are the eligibility requirements. So if you meet all those requirements, can you just ask your doctor for medical aid in dying and pick up the medication the next day? Well, a lot of people think that you can, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, there's a 12 plus step process in California that a patient has to go through in order to qualify and obtain um, aid in dying medication. So today we're not gonna go through all 12 steps because you really don't need to know all of those 12 steps to start the process and make sure you're able to get the medication if you're a terminally ill person who meets the, the eligibility requirements. But we are gonna give you the cliff notes. There's really one most, the most important thing you can do in order to get medical aid in dying, if you're sick, is to talk with your doctor. I can't stress this enough. If you think there's even a 1% chance that you may want the option of medical aid in dying one day, talk to your doctor today. Because unfortunately, it can be very difficult to find a doctor who will support you in the option of medical aid in dying. And there's a couple of reasons for that. If your doctor says they can't support you in the option of medical aid in dying, you should find out why. Is your doctor allowed to prescribe? 
97% of religious healthcare systems in California do not let doctors support patients in the option of medical aid in dying. That means that even if a doctor wants to support you in the option, they're not allowed to. And um, the reason for this is because they, the, and there are actually, there's secular systems too who won't let doctors prescribe. Doctors can opt out if they don't want to, which is really important. So if a doctor doesn't feel comfortable, they don't have to do it. But if they do feel comfortable doing it, it can be difficult. So Dignity Health, for example, is the biggest um, religious healthcare system in California. They do not allow doctors to prescribe. Adventist is another large healthcare system that doesn't allow doctors to prescribe. So you should find out right away if, you're, if your medical care allows doctors to practice the full range of end-of-life medication. Are you the first patient requesting medical aid in dying? You know, there's a high chance that your doctor may not even know this law exists. Now at Compassion and Choices, we work really hard to do a lot of clinical education for medical providers, but California is a really big state and they, they don't teach end of life um, to, to physicians very often. In fact, they're starting to now, but um, a lot of doctors aren't even taught about the various end of life options or how to have conversations with patients. You know, a lot of doctors still see death as failure, but it's not. Every one of us is going to die. And so knowing what your options are and being supported by your doctor is really important. I myself have talked to my doctor because having this option available to me is very important even though I'm not sick. But I wanted to make sure that if I were to become eligible, that my doctor would support me in, in this. And, and to me, it's a value thing too. I want to make sure that my doctor supports my values. And my doctor was shocked when I asked him. No one had ever asked him before, and he, he really didn't know that much about the law. Um, he learned really quickly about my job since it was strange that I knew so much about the law, and he had to think about it. But after he thought about it, he said, you know what, if you were eligible and you met all the requirements, I would support you in the option of medical aid and dying. And I was really relieved because it can be very difficult to find a doctor um, when you're healthy. So imagine how difficult it can be when you're sick and trying to find a doctor to support you in this option. So that's why, again, it's so important to talk to your doctor right away and ask them if they would support you in this option if it's important to you. Now, if you are terminally ill and your doctor is hesitant about whether or not they should support you or they've never supported a patient before and, and they're not sure about it, we provide a free confidential consultation program called doc to doc So your doctor can call this number and a doctor who has prescribed medical aid in dying before can walk you through this, walk the doctor through the steps and help them and mentor them so they'll feel comfortable and understand what to expect. If your doctor says no and there's just no way that your doctor can support you in this option, ask your doctor to refer you to another doctor who will support you so that you're not left hanging and you know, hopefully your doctor will make sure that, um, that you're able to find someone who will support you. Finally, you can call our end of life consultation line for support. This is a great resource and I do wanna, I do wanna point out it's the same phone number as doc to doc but a different extension. So you can call our end of life consultation for any end of life questions you may have. But if you are having problems finding a doctor, they can try to help you find um, a healthcare system, a hospice uh, who, where doctors are allowed to support patients in the option of medical aid in dying and um, do their best to make sure you're supported. And we will send you this information in a follow-up email after the webinar. So if you can't find a pen, don't stress about it. So you found a doctor who will help you with, um, with the with providing the prescription. What do you do next? So after you find that first doctor, you need to find a second doctor who will confirm your eligibility. Now the first doctor should help you with this. Um, so that's why again, finding that first doctor is the most important thing because usually if you find the first doctor, they'll help you find the second one. And the second one just has to confirm your eligibility. It's that first doctor is to fill out all the paperwork and there's a lot of paperwork. Um, and, and make sure that you get through the process. You also have to make a second request to the doctor who will write the prescription 
And this second request has to be separated by a mandatory minimum 15 day waiting period. This can be a really long time if you're terminally ill. And we know from a study that Kaiser Southern Cal California released that one third of their patients who otherwise would have qualified for medical aid in dying, they met all the eligibility requirements, they didn't survive that 15 day waiting period. So again, this is another reason to try to, you know, get the process started right away because um, it can take a long time. There's also a written request that you need to turn in and it can be submitted um, during that 15 day waiting period to your doctor. Uh, there's a final attestation form that you'll sign before you take the medication. Um, you may be referred for a third mental health assessment to make sure that you're mentally capable of making decisions and that you understand why you're making this decision as well. So, the good news is, is, even though it may sound very challenging to get through the process, it is possible. Uh, we can see from the California Department of Health that in the year 2019, 246 different doctors wrote 618 prescriptions for medical aid in dying. Uh, of those people who received prescriptions, 405 people ingested their medication. So remember that stat I said earlier? about one third of patients who go through this whole process to get their, their aid in dying medication never actually take it, but just having it on hand gives them a huge sense of relief. We have data from the first three and a half years that the law was in effect. And um, we don't know the total number of doctors who wrote prescriptions because they're very careful. You know, they don't wanna reveal anybody's identity, obviously. Um, but we do know the total number of prescriptions are nearly 2,000. And by this time, you know, I'm sure there's well over 2,000 prescriptions that have been written for medical aid in dying. We know that over 1,000 patients were enrolled in hospice. Hospice can be a great and wonderful thing. And we really encourage anyone who is planning on taking aid in dying medication to enroll in hospice. Um, we can also see that statistic again about two thirds of the people who got their prescription took their medication, but one third did not. And it's, it's really interesting because we see this exact same statistic in all the authorized states that have authorized aid and dying medication. So start talking, talk to your doctor, talk to your family, make sure that your family understands and supports your decision. Um, you know, talk to your friends if you feel comfortable. I, again, it's, Death is often referred to as the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to think about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. But, you know, thinking about it can actually make you enjoy life really even more because it's, you know, we're so lucky to be here and you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, so talk, talk about your values and what you want. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Tom Whaley, Tom's wife, Christine. Um, wanted the option of aid in dying medication. So I'm gonna let him tell you uh, her story. Hi everyone, um, I'm going to a little more full screen here just to get a little closer to you here. Um, my name is Tom um, and as Sam mentioned it, um, Christine and I had a bit of a journey. Um, I'll start off, you can maybe know her a little bit. This here, let me get this right. That's um, Christine and I on our wedding day. Uh, lots of joy in that moment, uh, even though she was actually in, actively fighting cancer during this moment. Um, she had um, malignant melanoma on her neck, um, and we discovered that in in 2012. Yeah, 2000, September 2012. Um, and Christine was very active in trying to fight it. Right, she was given a not necessarily a great prognosis, but they were told her, yeah, you maybe can make it three years if you're lucky. Um, but Christine, uh, Christine decided to be um, very active and fight it hard. Um, we went through some normal surgeries, um, some normal therapies, those things didn't seem to work. Uh, we moved on to experimental trials um, during the process of the next uh, six years after 2012. So we went through at least three different clinical trials that she got enrolled in. Um, some of them were very harsh. Some of them were, were gave her some respite from the, the problems, um, but it never went away, right? It kept coming back in other forms. Um, and as, as it went on, we talked, we visited. Um, 
when we first got a doctor, um, Christine picked a doctor that she thought was very scientific and met her values that she thought of. Um, but she always expressed to me that she didn't want to die like her, uh, her grandmother did. Uh, her grandmother died of breast cancer, um, bedridden, um, out of it, and, and not in a good circumstance. And Christine wanted a um, much more loving, um, together kind of death experience, a death ritual that she thought would fit her value system and what she wanted. And she verbalized that to me. We talked about it. We visited what, what that would look like. Um, and by then, 2015, we knew that it was legal at this point. So we're still seeing her doctor. We're still going through all these things. Um, and her doctor at the time, her um, oncologist, was an independent practice, right? But at some point in here, somewhere around 2016, he sold his practice. Um, and now was under the umbrella of a new healthcare provider. And when Christine approached him, as we got near and near to things happening, like at this point, she was going through gamma radiations, uh, had head wounds. Um, we were spending months at a time at, at UCLA going back and forth for treatments. Um, so she approached her doctor and said, okay, so what's it going to take? I'm getting near the end. I'm probably down to the last six months. He said, I'm sorry, but I don't support this. Well, he was in a religious hospital and we had no clue that it had changed like that. Um, or we just weren't aware that that was something that could happen where uh, an organization would say no to the doctor or the doctor themselves could say no. Um, of course, to support the right to say no, but we didn't realize that we needed to ask these questions, right? So now we're in a situation where we don't have someone to go to. Like, what do we do at this point? Um, so Christine was her own best advocate. She started asking tons of questions, calling around to hospices. But this is fairly early in the process. The law was in 2015, and, and we're only in 2017 right now. And, it's, and we're kind of in a rural area, so it wasn't very popular here. And the majority of the healthcare around us is all religious. There was very few secular um, medical facilities, and those ones hadn't ever experienced this yet, and they weren't comfortable doing it yet. Um, so Christine kept asking questions, and at one point she found compassion and choices and got some directions on doctors outside of her areas to start talking to. And then we realized that we had a medical connection to UCLA from our trips down there, and UCLA would support Christine through her journey. Um, but at this point, Christine's like, she's getting weaker and weaker. We're in the spring of 2018. And we know that she has a very short time to live. I mean, she can barely make it to the, the local doctor as it is. And driving to LA at this point is a huge burden on us. It's, it's about a four hour trip each way for us just to get down, down to LA. Um, but it was important to Christine. So we made this possible. Um, we, we did multiple trips down there. So we did our first trip to talk to the doctor down there. Um, we submitted all of our work. And on the way home from that first day there where we got to talk to the, the, the main doctor and the seconding doctor, we found out on the way home that the law was temporarily on hold. And I mean, here we were relieved. Christine was so happy that she could, it, it gave her hope that she saw the path, these 12 steps forward and how she could get there. And all of a sudden it was yanked from us and we didn't know it was coming back. So Christine reached out to her, her, um, state senator, she reached out to the state attorney general, she reached out to other organizations and was vocal about where she stood and what she wanted, and she got help back, right? Um, eventually, the law got held, upheld um, by the state Supreme Court, and after a longer than 15-day delay, we did get the medication. Um, and sometime, that was in June, and sometime in late July, Christine was able to come home after another physical trip down to LA and back, just to pick up a prescription, um, come home with her medication. Um, ab about two, two weeks later, um, as things began to get more and more rough on Christine, she decided it was the time. And so then on August 25th, 2018, um, we had her death day. Uh, she planned it out, her day and how she wanted to go. She set up her Pandora station. Um, she had the music on that she wanted. She had the people there that she wanted. And as her, her health was lower and lower, and, and she, she ingested the medication as I held her, and she held our dog, and, and she slowly went. Um, she went to peaceful. She went with the way she wanted to go and how she wanted to, how she envisioned her death being, right? Um, not to give anything against her, her fight. She fought hard for six years to stay here with us, but it, her time had come. Um, and just to show you a little bit more about her, uh, afterwards, uh, she was a painter a little bit. She left me a special painting that she found, I found in the house later. Um, 
she was the rock. I was the whimsical wind um, in our relationship. And uh, that showed the connection of what she wanted and where she was headed and, and her fight. Um, so I, I think going from this, like talk to your doctor, find out where your doctor stands, find out where your medical, your medical support system stands in your life um, in your loved ones. And what, if your wishes and how you, what's legal to you are to be upheld or furnished by those who are um, giving you care. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Sam. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for sharing her story and um, those beautiful pictures. Um, I want to remind everybody, I'm going to talk about a couple of resources and then we'll, um, we'll have some questions. So again, if you have any questions at any time, you can type your questions into the chat box and we'll get to as many questions as possible um, shortly at the, end of, at the end of our presentation. So let me pull my slides back up. All right. So how can you help? I'm sure you're tired of us saying this, but I'll say it again. <laughs> Talk to your doctor. Um, this, is, this is also the best way to change uh, healthcare systems and hospitals too. If you know, we have doctors, we have a program called Doctors for Dignity that work on um, changing medical association uh, their policies on aid and dying. Um, a lot of them have changed to being neutral, which is what we want. We want doctors to be comfortable supporting patients in medical aid and dying if they want to. Um, but it really starts with you, you know, talk to your doctor. And again, if you have problems finding a doctor, reach out to us, we'll send you those resources afterwards. If you'd like to volunteer with us, we would love to have you. We have amazing volunteers across the state and we have a lot of different volunteer opportunities for, um, for people to help with. There's a lot of education and outreach we do um, and other activities. You can connect us with groups or organizations that would like to have a speaker give a presentation on aid and dying medication. So for example, I, I gave a presentation this morning to a Rotary Club. So if you think that you belong to a club or um, somewhere else that would like a presentation, let us know. Um, and connect us with medical professionals who would like to learn more about the law. We're all about education and outreach. Again, we do clinical um, education when we can, so please connect us. Share your story. I love this picture so much. You may recognize the beautiful Brittany Menard in it. That's Brittany Menard with her husband, Dan Diaz. Um, Brittany said, having this choice at the end of my life has become incredibly important. Who has the right to tell me that I don't deserve this choice? Many of you may remember Brittany Menard. Um, she made a video that um, we, we supported that went viral um, because she was a California resident before the End of Life Option Act had passed and went into effect. And so there, there was no aid in dying in California and she had to move to Oregon. Her and her husband, Dan, moved to Oregon so that she could access the law. Um, she had a terrible terminal cancer and um, when she got her medication, she felt free. She was able to travel and enjoy the final months and weeks of her life. Stories are so powerful. Brittany's story helps people understand why having this option is so important. So if you have a personal story like Tom um, or someone else, then um, let us know. We have a full-time employee who her whole job is to help people share their stories if they feel comfortable. And we're happy to work with you to, to share your story. Christina will talk yeah. to you about our resources. Thanks, Sam. And thank you, Tom. So at compassionandchoices.org forward slash California, you can find information, resources, and tools specific to our state and the End of Life Option Act. And as Sam mentioned before, we do have an end of life consultation line, also known as EOLC, and they provide confidential, non judgmental, professional support and information on the full range of end of life options, including end of life planning anywhere in the country. The EOLC line can be reached via our Compassion and Choices toll free number which is 800-247-7421. And when prompted, you press seven. 
Uh, just plan to leave a message with your name and phone number. They will get back to you within one to two business days. Sam, do you want to talk about our materials? Yes, thanks, Christina. Uh, we have resources available in California in three different languages, English, Spanish, and traditional Chinese. Um, so let us know if, uh, if you would like any of these. We also have them on our website. Um, we also have a COVID-19 toolkit, which is available in English and Spanish. And it does include an addendum for your advanced healthcare directive in the case of you contracting COVID-19. And we'll be sharing that link after the webinar. Uh, and we do offer free virtual presentations right now tailored for your organization. We can present to your local church community organization or service group. Uh, topics do include advanced healthcare planning, preparing for dementia and end of life options, including medical aid in dying and voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Uh, I will send out the link to this, this webpage um, after the call. I am so excited about this next webinar coming up on November 5th. It's going to be so powerful and I really encourage all of you to attend and invite your friends and family. It's a national webinar on patient perspectives on medical aid and dying. Um, one of our uh, colleagues, Donna Smith, who's in Washington, DC, is going to be moderating this powerful webinar. We're, we're doing it um, with the City of Hope. It's hosted by the City of Hope. Tom is going to be sharing Christine's story again on this webinar. And there are two other people, one from Colorado and one from Washington, DC, whose loved ones accessed um, aid and dying laws similar to California's law. And they're gonna be sharing their stories about that. Um, this is, you're not gonna to wanna to miss this. This is going to be such a great um, webinar. And the cool thing is, is if you're a medical provider, or if you know a medical provider, you can get continuing education credits for um, taking part for watching this webinar. So if you have friends who are doctors, nurses, social workers, let them know that this is a way to get a continuing education credit um, and they can share this, this experience with you. Uh, and after the, after this again, and that, and that important email we'll be sending out, um, we're going to have two different links. So if you want the continuing education credit, um, there's a different link than if you're, if you don't want the credit and you just want to register to watch it. Um, so make sure you click on the right link to register. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. And you can contact us anytime. Um, Christine and I uh, love to help, and so these are this is these are our email addresses. You'll recognize them when we email you. You probably already have Christina's uh, and our phone numbers, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Compassion and Choices is funded almost exclusively by individual donors. I know everybody is having a hard time right now, but if you have the capacity to make even a small donation. Uh, it means so much to us and we really couldn't do this work without your help. Um, you may be bored by all the resources we just talked about because there's so many and we have even more resources we didn't even include. We just, you know, included the highlights, but these resources are so important and, you know, all of us are going to have to face the end of life at some point. And so our work is just so incredibly important. So if you're able to give, um, we, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And with that, um, we will now uh, have do, go turn it over to questions. I'm, I'm not speaking well today. Usually I do, I, I communicate better, but I'm off today, but that's okay. Um, at any time, if you have a question, put it in your chat box. And I think uh, Christina will be moderating the questions. Yeah, I will. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> um, well, the first question that came in, will we be sending out a recording? We will, most likely we'll be sending it to you tomorrow. Um, so you will get that from us for sure. Uh, I say, oh, go just, ahead. Yeah, just really quickly. We're planning on doing this webinar again in January. Hopefully, um, we'll communicate a little <laughs> more efficiently, but, um, if you have friends or family who you think would like to watch a live webinar like this and ask questions live, we'll be sending out the date for that in the next couple weeks. So, but it'll be in January sometime. Okay. The next question, this is for Sam. 
when does end of life begin? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I thought you'd like it. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Since my brain's working so well. I, I can add a couple of things if you want, and then that might get you going. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, in order to participate in the law, you do have to get that six month ter terminal prognosis. Um, and I think the term end of life is unique to the individual who takes the medication. And um, we know based on um, some reporting, they do it for various reasons. It could include loss of autonomy, not wanting to be a burden on their family. But I think the most important thing to remember is that um, these individuals, these people like Christine, they don't want to die. Their disease is killing them. Do you want to add more to that, Sam? Sure. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if you're asking more philosophically, but I think Christina made a really good point. So in order to qualify for the End of Life Option Act, you can't start that process until you're terminally ill with six months or less to live. Full stop. Um, so, you know, even though we keep saying talk to your doctor, like I know my doctor will support me, but I cannot start that process unless I've been diagnosed with a terminal illness in six months less to live. I'll just say quickly about when does end of life begin, you know, my personal story, I was raised by a mom who had a terminal illness. And so we talked about death and dying a lot in our family. And, you know, I, I was, I wasn't sure if she'd make it to my high school graduation. And we were extremely lucky. My mom was able to be put on an experimental medication. She had a liver transplant and she's actually still alive today, um, you know, more than 20 years after I graduated from high school. So when does end of life begin? You know, the philosophical part, I think that's for each person to decide, but in terms of the end of life option act, it's, it's pretty clear. Thank you, Sam. Um, so here's another question, um, and I think I can answer it. Are there resources within the state which can, which can help with questions, paperwork, and keep us updated on legal changes? Uh, I do want to encourage everyone to go to compassionandchoices.org forward slash California, um, which is our California state page. And from there, we have a whole section. It's called resources for patients. Uh, there's detailed information about the End of Life Option Act, including the forms required for the law. Um, and we can send out some of these links after the webinar. Do you want to add anything to that, Sam? Yeah, um, I, I definitely wanted to talk about um, the case that Tom mentioned. So in 2018, there was a short period of time in which the law was invalidated. Compassion and Choices was um, part of working to make sure the law was reinstated, which it is. Um, that fight continues, um, but we, it is highly unlikely that the law will be invalidated again. Um, you know, the, the case has gone up to the Supreme, the state Supreme Court and back down. Um, there's not much standing, but we do have on our website updates of that legal challenge. Um, it's called On versus Hestron. So if you're interested in the court case, uh, you can follow it on our website. And Tom, we have a question for you. Is it easier to access the End of Life Option Act in San Luis Obispo now? It, it actually is. Um, Christine <laughs> took the bold move of writing a letter to the editor in our, our local paper. Um, and then the paper was so intrigued that they actually followed up with a two-part, full-page front, back-to-back uh, -back weekends article about her, her story. Um, and that generated a lot of conversation with the local hospice system and the local hospital system. And um, Compassion and Choices was able to host some talks up here for people that were interested. And, um, and so people were able to actually talk about this more. And that has led to doctors being more willing to prescribe up here. And there are a couple of doctors, I think, that in this area that do support it now. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention too, you know, if you are interested in writing letters to the editor or writing op-eds, we have a great communications team that can help support you with that. So um, it was, it was again, those personal stories. I love Christine's op-ed. It was so powerful. Um, Sam, here's a question for you. I'm worried that the End of Life Option Act isn't accessible to everyone. How can we make sure it's a, it, it is accessible? That's a great question, and I worry about that too. I, I live in the Inland Empire um, in Southern California in Redlands, 
and um, it's very difficult to access the law here. So the best way to make sure that we can that we can ensure everyone is able to access the law is through education and outreach. Um, you know, we're hoping that maybe one day we can amend the, the law to make it to remove some barriers, um, maybe sooner than later. Oregon actually amended their law. Um, now in Oregon, if the patient's unlikely to survive that 15 day waiting period, their physician can waive the waiting period. So they still have to go through the rest of the process, but they don't have to wait for 15 days. And that is huge. That means so many more people are able to access the option. Um, but again, education and outreach, uh, you know, if there's a healthcare system where you live that's not religious, that's not supportive, and you wanna, you wanna try to get them to change their policy, we can help you do that. You know, we have a lot of resources to support you. Um, and we'll work with you to try to make that happen. So volunteer with us if you know if you want a concrete way to make sure that there's more um, accessibility to the law in your uh, region, um, and to help us remove barriers and roadblocks. Thanks, Sam. Um, here's a question I'll, I'll try to answer. Must one be in hospice to access the End of Life Option Act? And um, it is not a requirement of the law, although we do encourage people to be on hospice um, to receive that additional support um, during that challenging time. I'll add to Christina, you know, a lot of hospices say that they fully support patients and all their end of life options, but then they won't let doctors support patients in medical aid and dying and they may not let staff be present when the patient takes their medication. So it's really important to interview your hospice if you have time and capacity um, to do so because not every hospice is the same. And again, if you, if you reach out to me or Christina or, or our end of life um, consultation line, we can help you find a hospice that's truly supportive of all end of life options and truly supportive of patient directed care, which is very important. Right, thank you, Sam. But you don't have to be enrolled in hospice to access the law. <laughs> Um, Tom, here's a question. What barriers would you remove from the current End of Life Option Act to create better and easier access for terminally ill patients? Well, I think Sam touched on a key one with the 15-day waiting period, because that, that hit us, because um, we didn't know how long our waiting period was going to be. Not only was it 15 days, it was almost a month, right? And we didn't know what was going to happen during that month. So to me, that that's a huge barrier. Um, that's the first one. I think another barrier that I like to see is that Maybe um, medical facilities, doctors are more open about where they stand. So it's easier to ask doctors this question. Um, so, something about, around some communication that maybe they could provide about what their stance was so that you know what kind of medical care you're going to receive with a particular doctor or a particular medical facility. A lot of them have that, but maybe they haven't displayed it. They haven't talked about it. Uh, it's seems to be a little bit something people don't want to talk about, which I understand, but maybe some more o open communication around that. For sure. Um, here's a question um, I'll try to answer. What if one has a diagnosis of advanced Alzheimer's or dementia and wants to end their life before the advanced stage happens? Um, is it possible and how does one plan for this? So um, as Sam noted during the presentation, um, if an individual does have dementia, they do not qualify for the End of Life Option Act, unfortunately. There are several end of life options for people with dementia, including refusing treatment, uh, stopping treatment, and then voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Uh, we have a lot of tools on our website. We have our Finish Strong program, um, and we also have our dementia healthcare provision. Uh, Sam, do you want to add to that? I, I think that you explained that really well. Um, you know, it's far more likely that a person is going to have Alzheimer's and not be able to access medical aid in dying than, um, you know, there's there, well, actually one third of um, seniors will end up with Alzheimer's. So it's important to talk to your family, um, fill out that advanced healthcare directive, know the different stages of Alzheimer's because there are different stages and there's a lot to think through, you know, depending on where you're at, what end of life option would you want? If you're 
if you're bedridden and you can't recognize your family, but you seem happy, do you want to, do you want to exercise an end of life option or not? Um, and so I, I really encourage everybody to check out the tools we have on our website. They, they make it really easy to think through these difficult things, um, but it can be difficult and emotional. And so, you know, um, make sure you're in a good state to be able to do that. But we have great resources to help with that. And there are options. Um, so there's another question. Um, what qualifies as a California resident? Uh, do you need to get a California license or ID? Is having a lease good enough? And so um, in order to be a California resident, uh, per the law, having a driver's license, a state ID, voter registration, if you own or lease property or a tax return, all qualify, would qualify you as being a California resident. So you don't have to have all of that, you just need to have one of those. <laughs> just to clarify. True. Thank you, Christina. Um, Sam, here's a question for you. If the new Supreme Court ends up getting rid of the Affordable Care Act, what will be the options for end of life? Should the law face a new challenge in California and end at the US Supreme Court, is there a danger that it could be repealed? Great question. So I'll start with the first one. Um, so, Medicare doesn't cover the cost of medical aid in dying. And that's really important to know because the majority of people who choose medical aid in dying tend to be enrolled in Medicare. The reason for this is in the 90s when Oregon first passed their law, Congress put a restriction on federal funds paying for um, aid in dying. Um, and so uh, if you get VA benefits, that won't cover it, neither will Medicare. However, the good news is, is that Medi-Cal, our state Medicaid, does cover aid in dying and almost all private health insurance cover um, medical aid in dying. So um, most people who are on Medicare either um, choose to use private insurance or they pay out of pocket for the medication. And the medication tends to cost around $400, which can be very difficult for people. Um, but there, again, Medi-Cal can, can cover that cost. The second question about the Supreme Court, we don't think the current case will go to the Supreme Court. Our state Supreme Court already um, pushed it back down. The, you know, the, the, they're really, they don't have good legal standing and, um, you know, we don't really anticipate that court case getting any further. Um, you know, then, it, then it becomes a question of state law versus federal law if something were to go up to the, the, the US Supreme Court. So, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly what will happen, but we definitely have the law here in California and I encourage everybody to vote. That's all I'll say for whoever you want to vote for. Uh, here's a question which I can definitely answer. How can I volunteer for Compassion and Choices here in California? So uh, if you go to compassionandchoices.org forward slash volunteer, you can sign up to volunteer. Uh, Leslie and I, uh, Leslie is behind the scenes right now. We offer a monthly new volunteer sign-up training, which I think we have one on October 21st. And for our volunteers, we need volunteers across the state. We have action teams across the state and they help educate communities about the law. We also work to educate healthcare systems and hospices. Uh, our, our volunteers help us with administrative work. They help with presentations and do outreach to local organizations. So we're always looking for volunteers. Sam, here's a question for you. Do you know if Kaiser as a system supports end of life options? Yes, Kaiser's wonderful. They're very, very good with um, supporting patients in the end of life option act. It is, I think it is important to note that um, Kaiser Southern California has a slightly different policy than Kaiser Northern California, but both of them have doctors who support patients in the option of medical aid in dying. Um, I, I do want to say, though, that, you know, when you do talk to your doctor and you make your first oral request, because, you, you know, you need to make, you need to ask your doctor two times, remember, separated by the, that 15 days, make sure your doctor writes down in your chart that you made that first oral request. Um, I have heard stories uh, from patients who thought they made their first oral request, but the doctor didn't document it as their first oral request. And so then they ended up having to start the clock all over again on the 15 day waiting period 
um, when the doctor did finally put in the chart that first oral request. So um, that's important to note, but Kaiser's, Kaiser's is, is great. They, they really do support the full range of end of life options. Um, and there's a question about how long does it take to access the medication? I'll say on average, it can take between four to six weeks to get the medication. Um, I think it can take a yeah. lot less, actually. I mean, it depends where you go. Do you mean like once the, once you qualify? The whole the process. Whole the whole so process. yeah, so four to six weeks maybe for the whole process. If you're at a really efficient system, you know, they'll get it done in 15 to 20 days. But um, Kaiser, both Kaisers tend to tell patients that once they qualify, it's an additional um, seven to 10 days for them to, to receive their medication. And if your doctor doesn't know where to go to fill your prescription, reach out to us because we do keep a list of pharmacies and pharmacists that, um, that will fill medical aid and dying prescriptions and it can be mailed in California. Sorry, Christine, I didn't mean to. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, here's a question. Does our website have the 12 step process to qualify and how does this affect the DNR? Do not resuscitate. Great question. Um, our website does uh, go through the process um, for qualifying for medical aid and dying. Um, so if you go, you'll see, uh, you'll see a, a place for patient resources. And actually we're, I think we, we're, we're getting a new webpage today or tomorrow. So it may change, but it'll be on both websites. It'll say patient resources and it goes through everything you need to do. Um, we have a really great uh, little booklet that um, you can use to make sure you, you've got everything that you need to get you through that process. What was the second part of the question, Christina? Was there another part? I think that was it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so there's a question, someone's asking for our contact information. We'll definitely be sending that out um, afterwards. Um, there's a question about somebody being concerned or having a hard time finding two physicians who are gonna support that decision. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, again, if you're, is especially if you're terminally ill and you're close to, you know, you, you meet the eligibility requirements, let Christina or I know, let um, the, our end of life consultation know, uh, and we will, we will work with you to try to help you find access. It is possible across the state. We actually have public service announcements running throughout the states. Palm Springs used to be the hardest place to find a doctor, and now there's um, two new hospices that are fully supportive of um, doctors and patients who want the option of medical aid and dying. Um, so it is possible to get access across the straight, the state. So don't worry, you know, I don't mean to, I, we don't need any more fear. Um, take a deep breath and um, we will do everything we can to help support you um, and make sure that you're able to find those two doctors. The second doctor is usually way easier to find because all they have to do is say, yes, this patient's terminally ill and they have six months less, less to, or less to live. It's a very quick thing. Um, so, it, you know, and it is possible. Don't lose hope. You can do it. Okay. We might have time for a couple more questions. There was a question asking if, um, if we think in California, we could get, um, our legislation to be similar to Oregon's legislation, you know, with the removal of the 15 day waiting period. Yeah, that's a great question. So I've actually been meeting with legislators for the last two years. Um, we have a lot of new legislators who weren't there when the End of Life Option Act passed. And um, I, I'm very hopeful that depending on, you know, who wins the election and ends up in our state legislature that, um, you know, maybe we could make a, an amendment similar to Oregon's law. Um, we know that that amendment's been working really well in Oregon. Uh, we actually had legislation in Hawaii that had that same amendment this year, and that would have that would have become law, but unfortunately when the pandemic hit, um, it wasn't considered a priority bill and the Hawaii state legislature essentially closed. Um, so they weren't able to get that amendment through, but I think that I think that it is possible. And if you're interested in helping with something like that, please sign up to get our emails and to volunteer with us. So that is all the time we have for questions. I know there were a lot more questions. If, you, if we didn't answer one, you know, feel free to uh, send us an email. Um, we'll do our best to respond. 
And um, I just want to give a special thanks to Tom Whaley for joining us today and my boss, Sam, and for all of you for being here today. Really quickly, before we go, I want to do one more poll. And that is, uh, the poll will come up in just a second. Did you find this presentation informative? Was it very helpful, somewhat helpful, and not at all helpful? And just a reminder, we are trying to offer these, um, these kind of intro to, uh, Leslie, will you go ahead and share the results? I'm so happy to, to see it was very helpful for people. Um, we're gonna be trying to offer these on a um, quarterly basis, uh, just to try and reach as many people as possible who want to know the specifics of the End of Life Option Act. Um, so please you know, share this information with your family or friends and um, we'll bring that down. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today and I hope you have a great evening. Bye everyone.